and uh, we will just go right to this next talk, which will be given by Jan Frederick, I guess. Yes. Okay. So he will talk about logic independent proof search in logical frameworks. Hello, I'm going to talk about logic independent proof search in logical frameworks. So what is this about? Well, a logical framework is a formalism that we can use to describe different logics. In this presentation, I'm going to use LF, the Edinburgh Logical Framework. We can, of course, use LF to describe logic with pen and paper, but there are also a lot of different computer tools we can use. In our research group, we have developed, for example, MNT, um, but others exist. Over the years, this has resulted in us writing down lots of different logics in a very modular way, which results in a big graph that looks roughly like this. So for example, here we would have the a th theory in LF, which describes the syntax of predicate lo of uh, propositional logic. And we can extend that into a first order logic syntax and we can describe different calculi and so on. That's just a small part of the graph. In reality, it's much bigger. It looks really messy like this. If you take a look at the entire graph like this. So we have lots of logics. The question is now, what can we do with that in terms of theorem proving? The first thing to notice is that if you have LF, proof checking is nothing else than type checking. So we can just we can just get it for free, really. But we, of course, have to still write the proofs. And that's a lot of work. So it would be really nice if we could just generate some provers automatically from these specifications. Uh, that's not easy. But we think it's really worthwhile because there are lots of different logics in here. Many of them are really unknown and obscure, might not have any dedicated provers for them. So we did some experiment in this direction, and I would like to talk about that. Before talking about prover generation, I want to show you how to describe a logic in the first place, starting with the logic syntax. So here we have a theory. Uh, that is supposed to describe the syntax of proposition and logic. The first thing we do is we have a new type called prop for propositions, and we use that to describe the different connectives. So notice a unary operation and end in our binary operations and propositions. We can also describe the syntax of first order logic by importing everything from before and introducing a new type for terms. And then we can Describe quantifiers like all and exists using higher order abstract syntax. We can also describe the semantics. There are different mechanisms in MMT for that, but that's not really relevant for this talk. So instead, I'll show you how to describe the calculus next. Here we have the natural deduction calculus for propositional logic. The main thing is a symbol which I call det here, which maps propositions to types. So we follow the judgments as types paradigm. If you're not familiar with it, it takes some getting used to. You can think of that X as the type of all proofs for proposition X. So for example, we have the rule and elimination left, which is now a function that maps proofs of the proposition A and B to proofs of the proposition A. The curly braces are the MMT notation for the pi operator. So this whole thing works for all propositions A and B. We also can write other rules like all elimination and so on. And the big question now is how can we generate a prover from a calculus specified like this? We decided to create the provers in LP, which was created among others by Claudia, who is one of the authors of this paper. LP is an extension of Lambda Prolog. And the reason that we want Lambda Prolog instead of standard Prolog is that it supports, among other things, higher order abstract syntax. We need higher order abstract syntax for naturally representing, for example, quantifiers and other kinds of bindings. AP was used for implementing different kinds of logical algorithms like type inference unification, and we want to prove it, use it for proof search. So it's exactly the kind of thing we need. So how can we now create AP from our LF rules? I've just copied, for example, the end elimination rule. And if we now take a look at the type, of this rule, it turns out that we can directly translate it into LP. So pi a b turns into pi a pi b, and the debt a and b we just keep, the arrow turns into implication, and that gives us a valid LP rule. We can simplify it with some syntactic sugar, so we can 
drop the leading pies and we can use a different notation of implication, which gives us this expression over here. In this case, it's exactly like standard prolog. So if we want to prove A, we have to prove A and B, which is exactly what end elimination tells us. We can do the same translation for other rules. So for example, here I have all elimination and for all introduction. This is very straightforward. Nothing interesting is happening here. What I want to say at this point one more time is that we don't care about first order logic. It's just an example. What we're really after are more obscure logics for which we might not have any proof at all. All right, so the rules we generate here are logically correct, but the problem is that they don't actually result in a working prover. So if you look at this rule, for example, if we want to prove C, we just try to prove A or B. And with the step first search behavior of prolog, we would just right away run into a loop, run into a loop and not get anywhere. So the proof search just diverges. To fix this, we somehow have to control the search. This turns out to be rather tricky, which nicely illustrates that proof search is much harder than proof checking. To control the search, we decided to use helper predicates which is an approach that was inspired by the proof set project. They used it only for focused logics, but we don't restrict ourselves to that. The intuition behind helper predicates is that they decide whether or not a rule should be applied. So here, for example, I have the end elimination rule. And the first thing we do is we call a helper predicate. So we insert this code in there, which can then block the rule from being executed. This means we somehow restrict the search space but we do not change the correctness of the prover this way. These helper predicates often need some extra information about the proof state or something like that. So we insert some extra argument x here, uh, which just has some further information. The question is now what these helper predicates should look like and what kind of helper predicates we can generate automatically and uh, as logic independently as possible. Here you can see some of the helper predicates that we generate. The first one is probably the most obvious one, where we try to use iterative deepening search. Here, the argument would simply keep track of the search depth and the predicate just checks for the depth. Apart from restricting the search, we can also keep track of it to generate proof terms. So then the argument would be the resulting proof term. That alone is pretty useless because the prover would just diverge, so we wouldn't actually get anything, but we can of course combine it all with some other helper to restrict the search in the good way. For that, we can use the product helpers. They just allow us to take, for example, the intersection of iterative deepening and proof term generation. There's one more helper we have here, backchaining, which allows us to generate more efficient provers. The idea is that for some rules like end elimination, we have to guess a formula, in this case a conjunction, and that can be quite inefficient. So in backchaining, we try to improve on that by using forward reasoning. With all this, we can now generate a working prover for from a natural deduction calculus specified in MMT, for example, for first order logic. So far, we've only talked about natural deduction calculi. I'm finishing my master thesis right now in the area of natural language semantics, and there I care more about tableau calculi. So I thought let's give this a try as well. So here we have one of the rules. If we have A and B marked as false, we can split into two branches, one A marked as false, one with B marked as false, and then we just have to close both of them. Turns out that we can just rewrite it like this. And from this, we can directly translate it into LF. That's pretty straightforward. So if we have A and B marked as false, and we can close a branch with A marked as false, and we can close a branch with B marked as false, then we can close everything. And the same way as before, we can translate this whole thing to LP. Uh, we can just literally do it the same way and generate the same type of helper predicates. And then it turns out that if we just use iterative deepening, for example, we already get a working prover. That's pretty cool. So we didn't have to change anything. We just specified a different calculus and got a working prover. It's not the most efficient one because we apply some of the rules multiple times. Like if we apply this rule here, for example, we get exponentially many branches without gaining anything. If we keep track of how often we apply rules, then we get a more efficient prover. So to summarize, we can use LF to describe different logics. And we've shown you an experiment on how we can generate LP provers from the logics that we specify, so from the calcula. MMT has different mechanisms that we can use to check the soundness of the calculus. And that would carry directly into the soundness of the generated provers because the helper predicates don't change. 
we have two different people who would benefit from this. On one hand, we have logic developers who would get free provers for experimental logics. And on the other side, there are the prover makers who could just test their strategies across many different logics. The experiment is still at an early stage, of course. So to really evaluate it, we have to test it on more logics and try to implement more proof strategies. We expect that translating to first order logic and using a standard prover would probably be much more efficient. But on one hand, we think it's cool if we can just do it directly. And on the other hand, we get proof terms directly from our LP provers, which is nice. I did some test run. I just took some first order theorem, which I asked my generated prover to prove. It took about one second and it found a natural deduction proof at depth nine. I tried to do the same thing myself. It took me about 16 minutes, and that doesn't include actually entering the proof term and checking whether it's true, which would take a bit longer probably. And then I tried the same thing with Vampire, of course, and that took just one millisecond, so that's way faster. However, in the end, we want to apply this not to first order logic, but to some very obscure logics. And so there we would have the situation that either we have no proof at all, or maybe a generated slow prover, which would still be an improvement. That's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? I have a, a couple of questions, if, I, if there is time. Yes. Uh, the first question is that uh, if we have compared the um, performances with other uh, and, um, uh, frameworks or other generic prover like Isabel. So we haven't done a proper comparison, uh, but we don't expect to be very good against any dedicated prover there. So I mean, I, I did compare it here with Vampire, and that was already mm. way but slower. And if we have a more complex formulas, of course, it would be much, much worse. Okay. Okay. Well. And the other question, maybe I, I missed at the beginning. So what are the constraints on the, on the rules of the calculus in order to be representable in your system? Um, no, we did not uh, do a detailed analysis. In principle, any rule which looks... Oh, Sound somewhere. Sorry. Um, I don't think we have fully figured that out exactly what would work. In general, it works as long as we have rules which are combined with these arrows and that we allow one level of nesting in there. Okay. Um, mixed with pies, but we didn't formally analyze that yet. At least I'm not aware of that. Maybe one of the co-authors knows more about that. So can, can you tell me, do you know a logic that I would not be able, or, or a calculus that I would not be able to handle? Um, Nested sequence. Possibly, so yes, I wouldn't know how to represent that in the first place, actually. In general, anything that an F should, in principle, result in something, but it probably wouldn't result in a, not necessarily result in an actual working prover. We have to explore that more to how to scale it. Um, also, I think natural deduct. So, if you had modal logics, for example, I'm not sure how that would work because there we wouldn't have nice natural deduction calculi in the first place. And I'm not sure how easily you can represent the tableau calculation and F for those. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It's, it's very interesting. Mm. Yes, thank you for your questions. I appreciate it. So I think while Jens tries to figure out his microphone, there is actually a question in the Q&A that I'm curious about as well. So what are the logics you're meaning to implement next? I'm not aware of any specific plan for what exactly we should do next. Personally, I'm interested in, I, I was thinking about, I don't know how easy it is, um, in working, adding the description operator, for example, and just play a bit around with variants of, or small extensions of first order logic, for example. Um, 
we also have, so what we did already is we can very simply, of course, add our delete match reduction rules here by just adding one, of, one more, one less. So we have already classical first order logic or intuitionistic logic and so on. We get all these automatically. And I would, yeah, I would personally be interested in what happens if we add, add the description operator, but we haven't really planned how to proceed, I think. Um, uh, did you already answer the question from Michael Kohlhaser? We also want to do model generation calculi. calculi? He, he is a co-author, uh, uh, so I, 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 don't, yeah. I doubt he's it was a, a question. That, that's what it, yeah, yeah, was, uh, that's what I just uh, saw some answer regarding the scope. Yeah, okay. Okay, very good. So um, then I think we are we already uh, not only used up our time, but we are just running a bit late. Um, thanks uh, again for uh, uh, the talk, uh, Jan Frederick, and. Yes. Um,